and welcome to Inside Medicine. My name is Brendan Bussman. I'm your guest host today. Inside Medicine is brought to you by Las Vegas Heels and produces this on a weekly basis. It's always live on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Joining us today is Dr. Dan Batlin. Welcome. Brendan, thank you so much for inviting me. Hey, pleasure to have you here. Um, you're obviously in the business of pain management. Um, talk to me a, bit, a little bit about what pain management is to begin with for those viewers that don't necessarily know. Well, certainly. Pain management is a branch of anesthesiology. So somebody who practices the field of pain medicine starts off their training after they graduate from medical school doing a three-year residency or training program in the field of anesthesiology. In my case, I was very fortunate. I completed that training at a well-known hospital called Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland. And then I worked for five years at a Johns Hopkins affiliate hospital uh, delivering anesthesia for my patients. And after that, I applied for some uh, prestigious pain management training programs, and that's referred to as a fellowship. And I was very fortunate to complete that training at an institution called the Cleveland Clinic, also very well known in the country. So pain management has as its goals the relief of pain and suffering. And Brendan, it's intuitive when you talk about the relief of pain. Uh, everybody can understand that concept. But I would say that the relief of suffering is something which is of equal stature or importance. Specifically, suffering is an emotional response. It's a person's emotional response when they find themselves in a situation which, correctly or incorrectly, they believe that they have no control over. And what's important to realize is that in almost all cases, somebody's chronic pain condition can be treated. It can be successfully addressed, and therefore, it is needless to endure suffering. It's a wasted emotion. Very good. So you've talked about your training at Johns Hopkins. You've talked about your further training at Cleveland Clinic. How How's a guy that ended up at two very prestigious institutions and, and uh, obviously is well-versed in his, in his trade end up in Las Vegas? Well, uh, that came from a recommendation from a relative of mine uh, who suggested that I explore the American Southwest. And so I came out to Las Vegas in 1999. Uh, I met a wonderful gentleman who was very gracious with his time. His name was Mark Howard, and perhaps, Brendan, that name sounds familiar to you. Uh, he was the CEO of Mountain View Hospital. And Mark actually was the first person that I met when I came to visit Las Vegas. And I explored from that interview uh, the possibility of establishing my practice here. And I discovered that what I had been told, I believe, was very much true, that at that time, 1999-2000, basically the turn of the century, the quality of health care in southern Nevada um, was open for well-trained, well-qualified individuals to come on in and have the opportunity to make their mark. And it turned out it's been a very, very successful move for myself. Very good. Well, I obviously, you've been in this town now almost 18 years. Correct. Um, how many offices do you have? Do you just have the one office, or do you have several now that you've been able to, to be here for such a long length of time and, and mm -hmm. tenure and building a practice here with good quality physicians? Mark, I think that there are several uh, things which distinguish my practice. And by the way, I should mention that my practice is... Uh, specialized pain management. And sometimes, as you and I are conversing, I may refer to something as SPM. So I'm referring to my practice there. Uh, we have five different locations for the convenience of our patients and the convenience of our referring physicians. Five locations here in Southern Nevada. And they are Summerlin, uh, the medical office building that's attached to Summerlin Hospital. The far northwest, which is the medical office building that's attached to Centennial Hills Hospital. We have an east location for those patients that that's convenient for. And that's uh, the medical office building that's on the campus of Sunrise Hospital. And our main location, which is just a beautiful office, as you and I were discussing, which is located in the Henderson Green Valley area, uh, pretty much close to McDonald Ranch, Valley Verde, and Horizon Ridge. Oh, very good. You know, I think it's important for our, for our audience to understand. Talk to, talk to me, share with uh, the audience what you were sharing with me about that just the way the feel and vibe you get when you go to that Henderson office. Certainly. Well, what you have to understand, once again, is that uh, I am addressing and interacting with individuals that have suffering and that have pain. And so I think it's very important to create an environment which is soothing, 
relaxing, and calming for patients. And so when you come to our main office, which is located once again uh, on Horizon Ridge in the Henderson Green Valley area, when you come to that office, you're greeted with, uh, first of all, a very warm and caring staff. And actually, I'm involved in the hiring decisions uh, for the entire office. So the staff are outstanding, and patients truly love them. Uh, Also, the office looks very much like a New York City art gallery or a New York City uh, jazz club, if you will, in the sense that we have uh, framed records from Ella Fitzgerald, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, all on the walls. We play XM, I believe it's XM71, which is watercolors, which is an easy jazz music. And, you know, again, it, it takes patients who are uptight, enduring pain, and it can chill them out and make them feel more welcome. Well, let's talk about that patient experience and what, what a patient would not only come to your office for, but, but talk about your procedures a little bit. Talk to, talk to us a little bit first off of what are, what, are, what are most people coming to your office for? What types of pain management do they need? Certainly. Well, Brendan, the bread and butter of the field of pain management uh, is low back pain and neck pain. And these things can be caused by spinal stenosis, by slipped or herniated discs. And of course, what can go along with that is something that is called radiculopathy. Now, you've heard the term sciatica. Sciatica is a radiculopathy situation that applies to the legs, to the lower extremities. Now, uh, mind you, radiculopathy certainly sounds like it's radiculous. And when you're a patient experiencing the sciatica or the radiculopathy in the legs, it feels ridiculous. But uh, no, the term is radiculopathy. Uh, So radiculopathy in a leg or in an arm refers to numbness and pain caused by a pinched nerve upstream at the level of the spine. Uh, So once again, low back pain, neck pain, pain and tingling and numbness that goes into an extremity caused by uh, pinched nerves, uh, spinal stenosis, headache, fibromyalgia, uh, benign, benign meaning non-cancer, female pelvic pain. All these are areas that we treat at Specialized Pain Management. Very good. Very good. Talk to me about some of the treatments. And I know one of the things that that I want to make sure people understand is uh, you use an epidural sometimes to to treat some of this. Correct. A very effective medication. But I think most people, when they hear epidural, they think of of a woman in pregnancy and getting ready to deliver. And and is that what, if I had back pain, what I'd be getting? or, Or is it something different? Well, Brendan, we're going to assume that you're not going to be delivering a baby on yeah, L&D I, I anytime soon. I hope not. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to find a PR agent and we're going to make some money together. Okay. Uh, well, the treatments uh, in pain management, uh, I would say that the most important thing uh, before we discuss the treatments is to have an accurate diagnosis. That's the beginning of quality health care. And so when a new patient is referred to our practice, we do a comprehensive history and physical evaluation. Uh, If indicated, we will uh, seek out radiology imaging, which can consist of just simple x-rays or an MRI. I would note that the meat, if you will, of a pain management problem very often is a soft tissue problem. Specifically, nerves are soft tissue. Discs are soft tissue. Uh, Calcification of ligaments, which impinge upon the nerves. All these items are soft tissue problems, and you can visualize these issues and, uh, and localize them to what level they are in the spine with an MRI and which you cannot with a plain X-ray. These problems are invisible with a plain X-ray. So we probably, in my practice, order about one dozen MRIs every single day on behalf of our new patients. Now, in terms of the treatment modalities, uh, they can consist of anything from modest and cautious and careful medication management referrals for physical therapy, Uh, the best thing which an interventional anesthesia-trained pain management specialist does, somebody, in other words, who has training like myself, is a series of very simple cortisone shots, of which the most common is an epidural, as you're referencing. Uh, There's other uh, injection procedures that we do too. And then it's also important to remember and to recognize and to honor your colleagues in the community. Would the benefit, patient benefit rather from a referral to, say, a neurologist for nerve testing procedures called EMG NCV? Would they possibly benefit from a referral to a spine surgeon, to an orthopedic joint specialist, or to a neurosurgeon? So these are decisions that we are faced with with our patients every single day in my practice. Now, as to uh, the injections that a pain management specialist does, when somebody presents with a 
typical scenario of bulging discs, pinched nerves, low back pain, and sciatica. And once again, sciatica or radiculopathy is a term that we use to refer to numbness and pain shooting into the legs as caused by a pinched nerve at the level of the spine. A very effective form of treatment is an epidural. Now, uh, as an anesthesiologist, uh, yes, Brendan, I was awake at 3 in the morning and at 5 in the morning putting in those epidurals on laboring parturients or laboring women who are about to deliver. Uh, and there's some very important differences between the epidural that's performed in pain management on a man or a woman versus the epidural which is inserted when a woman is about to give birth to a baby on labor and delivery. And those differences are, number one, the liquid which is being injected through the needle when somebody presents to a pain management specialist and has pinched nerves, bulging discs, the liquid is a cortisone medication, a very dilute concentration of cortisone. Okay, When a woman is going to give birth on labor and delivery, the liquid is a dilute concentration of a local anesthetic. Now, very importantly, it is technically the same needle inserted into the same tissue plane in the spine. And of course, that's referred to as the epidural space. A couple of other important differences are when an anesthesiologist or a pain management specialist is inserting an epidural, in pain management, I have the benefit of having access to an x-ray camera. So I can actually see the angle of insertion of the epidural needle relative to certain classic bone or bony landmarks. Whereas, of course, by definition, when a woman's on labor and delivery, you can't use an x-ray camera to aid or to assist in the insertion of the epidural needle because you have an unborn baby in the woman's belly. Uh, other differences. When a woman is on labor and delivery um, and the anesthesiologist is inserting the epidural needle, you can't use too much sedation because most of those medicines like Valium would cross the placenta and depress the baby's breathing after the baby is born. Whereas when a man or woman is presenting to my office and we're contemplating performing an epidural at the outpatient center, which is where we perform these procedures, so it's a very efficient and a very smooth process, we can administer plenty of sedation so the person is comfortable. Uh, my attitude when performing these simple cortisone shots is that there is no reason that a pain relief procedure should be painful to experience or to endure. So we sedate our patients very comfortably. In fact, I would say in most situations, Brendan, our patients actually close their eyes and nod off. Mind you, it's not general anesthesia, it's twilight sedation, but it's a sufficient amount of it that patients will lose track of about two or three minutes of their lives. And customarily, they'll open their eyes in the recovery room, and it, it's actually rather charming because a patient will turn to the recovery room nurse who's providing the care to them there and will say, when is Dr. Batlin going to begin my procedure? And, of course, the nurse will smile and say, what are you talking about? This is recovery room. Don't you know he's already completed the procedure? You're done. Here's your juice. Here's your chocolate chip cookies. Now let's get you ready to, uh, to go home. So, so talk to me a little bit about that because you started to get into the actual procedure, and obviously we've talked about what, it, what a difference in epidural is with a pregnant woman versus somebody like me that would walk in with lower back pain. How long does that procedure take? And, and when, obviously, depending on what I have wrong with me and what's going on, how long does my treatment typically last over over time? Right. Well, uh, to perform one of these procedures, once again, when you have the benefit of having a X-ray machine called a fluoroscope in the procedure suite, and that is the current standard of care, uh, typically it will take less than one minute to perform one of these procedures. So they're simple, they're efficient, and they're very comfortable to experience when you're on the receiving end as a patient. In terms of the duration, the procedures are customarily performed in a series and at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, where I did my training, they were customarily performed in a series of three. The reason being that a cortisone procedure, when you're doing a nerve block, which is what an epidural is, that is a cumulative event. It's a cumulative activity. And so how much relief you receive, our patients experience very often is additive where the third builds on the benefits of the second, which builds on the benefits from the first. In fact, I would say to you, Brendan, that if you live in a house which has a cinder block foundation, as you know, one layer of cinder block rests on top of another layer of cinder block, which sits on top and is supported by another layer of cinder block. And it's the same thing with the cortisone epidurals. In terms of the duration of pain relief, 
Uh, we have one patient who is very much a beloved patient in our practice. Uh, she's from back east, which is where I am from. Uh, for HIPAA reasons, I'll simply refer to her as Karen, first initial, last name, S. But I met Karen in 2011, and we did the standard series of the three lumbar epidurals. She did not return requesting to repeat the procedures for five years until March of 2016. At that point, her MRI was so old, I think that her MRI is probably about seven years old at that juncture. So, of course, we updated the imaging. We went ahead and repeated the series of the injections, and that was about a year and a half ago, and I haven't heard a peep from Karen. And she's the kind of person who will certainly be calling our office when the pain starts to return. So in her particular situation, it's been five years. Wow, that's phenomenal. Thank you. How, how much has, you know, you talked about the MRI, you talked about the x-ray so you can get the, get the diagnosis, the diagnosis just right and hit that, that sweet spot, if I can call it that. Correct. How much does technology play into this? How much does, and how much has it evolved with, with the patient you mentioned, Karen S. Right. Uh, you know, from when she first came in in 2011 to where she came in 2016, or even if she'd come in tomorrow. Right. How much does technology play a role in that? Well, you know, I was very gratified to go back to the 25th anniversary of my medical school graduation. Uh, I attended a Catholic medical school in Chicago, Loyola University of Chicago, and we received a tour of all the new buildings, all the educational suites uh, that the students uh, are now rotating through. And I was truly impressed that for the benefit uh, that the internet and electronic education has brought to the students, that the education is very much like what I went through. I graduated in 1985, and you have to be a good diagnostician first. That's, that's absolutely essential. Um, and in fact, that's something which my father, who is a retired physician and a Korean War veteran, my dad's going to be 93 in September, and he's doing very well. Uh, he's somebody that I'm very proud of. When uh, he saw the education that I was receiving in the early and mid-1980s, he could relate to it right away because these are the things that he was grounded in. So you have to be able to not rely on, not use as a crutch, these technical tools. Now, that withstanding, let's be honest, uh, the MRI is a, a fabulous invention. Mm -hmm. It provides information that uh, uh, none of us are born, in other words, with x-ray vision. Um, in fact, my father is a radiologist, and even he does not have x-ray vision. <laughs> so um, it's a blend of both, I would say. Very good. Very good. I know, I know one of the things we continually hear nationally um, that's, a, that's an issue in the healthcare space is the op opioid issue mm -hmm. um, that uh, people use for, for pain relief. And obviously, your, your process is a lot different than that. H how do people view pain management and how can some of these other things uh, help, I'll say, diagnose the, the, the opi opioid issue that we have in, the, in this country? Right. Well, firstly, I think it's important for me to emphasize that my own approach or my own philosophy, Brendan, is that I am very conservative when it comes to prescribing opioid medications. And here we're talking, of course, about narcotics, mm -hmm. uh, things called hydrocodone, Vicodin, uh, formerly known as Lortab. Uh, Percocet, morphine, for all these medications, assuming that we're not talking about an unfortunate scenario of cancer pain. And there, my goodness, make those patients comfortable. Do what needs to be done. Do it in a safe manner, but make those patients comfortable. But when we're talking about benign, benign meaning non-cancer pain, my own approach, I'm very safe and very conservative. And what I would say is that you need to have developed a skill and Brendan, I have that skill of being able to politely communicate to a patient, hey ma'am, hey sir, I think that the amount that you were taking from that previous healthcare provider or the amount of pain medication that you're seeking just does not seem to be supported by the data or doesn't seem to be you know, supported by your history and your physical examination. How about if we try another approach? So if somebody comes in and they're taking six Vicodin tablets per day, uh, if their history and physical examination leads me to believe that they have a herniated or a slip disc and some pinched nerves, I'll suggest, why don't we get some data? Why don't we find out whether or not this amount of medication you're taking is supported by an MRI? And if it turns out that we find issues or problems on the MRI, what else can we do? 
And I would say that if somebody comes in and undergoes a series of epidurals and they tell me that they're 50 percent better, and if it turns out that their reliance or usage of narcotic medications drops by 50 percent, I know I've done a good job. How, how many people, um, as part of that, though, um, walk into your office, not obviously on opioids or anything, I come in with back pain? Uh, from maybe a sports injury, I was playing basketball or fell or something along the way. Certainly. That how, you know, you talked about Karen S in five years. What What's typically the recovery time and maybe the the repeat to come back for another treatment? Is there that or or can you just sort of take care of my my issue and it's a it's a one and done or, or a, a small series of treatments, the three treatments you talked about. Right. And, and I, you know. Don't see you again. But talk to me about sort of what your patient mix is and, and how that works. Right. Well, of course, all of us would love to be able to invent that magic pill, yet it doesn't exist. That pill that will just snap your fingers, the pain is gone, it will never return, and your spine returns the way it was when you were 16 or 18 years old with no arthritis and no bulging discs. Uh, unfortunately, as you can imagine, as I'm sure our viewers know, we don't quite live in that perfect world just Not yet. yet. Not yet. We're, uh, we'll get there, though. We're working right? on it. Yeah, we're, we're working, working on, on it. it. Um, my typical patient, uh, honestly, I don't believe that we have a typical patient. And when I w- knock on the door and I walk into an examination suite and I'm going to greet a new patient, uh, somebody who's previously unknown to me, I don't put them all into one basket I want to focus on what a particular patient's problems are, understand them as a person, and treat them individually. And so I really wouldn't say that there is a typical patient. Yes, there are typical reasons, pardon me, why somebody will be experiencing pain, whether it's a bulging disc, a pinched nerve, spinal stenosis. But that's different from saying um, uh, we should just address all individuals as one group and put them all in one basket. So people need to be approached as individuals. If I had a back issue, Mm -hmm. how do I get into your office? Mm -hmm. Do I need a referral to get in there? What types of insurance do you cover? Certainly. And and that sort of stuff. Talk to me about how I would get into your office, or can I just call up and say, hey, uh, I got this pain in my back. Um, Right. Help. (laughs) Right. We have a lot of self-referred patients, and those patients are self-referred typically from other individuals who have been patients of our practice and who are pleased with the amount of pain relief they experienced, and just as importantly, pleased with the care that they receive from our practice. So uh, we desire or prefer to have a referral from a physician, and that could be a specialist or just a family practice doctor, because then we'll have some notes and we'll have some knowledge about the patient's history. We'll know how long they've been enduring the, the back pain, because that issue will be cited typically in a family practice doctor's note, uh, we'll understand whether or not there are any psychological variables on this particular patient that have been documented. And it's very important to be sensitive to those variables. Um, in terms of insurances, our practice accepts virtually all commercial insurances. Uh, we also do have some patients who unfortunately do not have health care insurance and they desire to be seen on a self-pay basis. And we keep that very reasonable. And then uh, we have a group of patients, a relatively small group of patients, who unfortunately have experienced a motor vehicle accident or some other form of a slip and fall situation. And they can be seen uh, based upon a medical services attorney lien. In terms of the insurances that we accept, geez, Brendan, you name all the common ones and I think we accept them. Of course, Medicare. Uh, we also take Blue Cross, Cigna, Aetna, United Healthcare, and Health Plan of Nevada. Very good, very good. What uh, you know? Uh, how long if I'm going in the three treatments? How how long are those spaced apart? Is it like I come in once a once a week for three weeks, or, or how does yes. that work? Yes, yes. And my experience is that typically patients will have the best response if they do them on a weekly basis. Very good, very good. If, uh, if there's anything else, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit more about your practice, but what, what else should our viewers know about, you know, obviously you've got the, the offices throughout the Valley, right. Uh, that obviously would take care of people, you know, in each segment. Right. Um, is there, uh, you know, is there something they need to know about all those offices or, or anything else that you want to make sure our, our listeners know? Yes, there certainly is. I think that the items that distinguish my pain management practice from the other pain management practice of which I'm aware here in Southern Nevada are the following things. 
Uh, number one, as we've discussed, uh, my training and my experience, I was so fortunate to be selected to train at Johns Hopkins for my anesthesia residency and the Cleveland Clinic Foundation for my pain management fellowship. Uh, the next thing, of course, is convenience. The fact that we do have all these offices spread throughout the Las Vegas Valley for the convenience of referring physicians and for the convenience of patients. Another very important thing that we have not touched upon, Brendan, is the fact that deliberately, intentionally, my practice does not utilize something referred to as PAs or physician's assistants. Now, as we get into this discussion, I want to make it very clear that in no way is this a slight or a slap on the hand of PAs. I think that they typically are very well-trained, very conscientious clinicians, and I applaud and support them. But pain management, you must understand, is a unique specialty, and patients want to form a relationship with their pain management doctor. And for that reason, and that's something that I picked up upon very early in my training, we have never hired a PA in my practice. So when patients come for their initial appointment and for all of their subsequent appointments, they will always get the opportunity to see me, to see their doctor. Very good. Um, obviously, with five offices, you've got a, probably a pretty good staff along the way mm -hmm. uh, that help you with that. Um, what would they say about you as a person? Just know, getting to know, uh, as opposed to just Dr. Batlin, as most patients know you. Talk to me about Dan. Well, um, uh, I try to be on time. Uh, they would laugh, as you are right now, Brendan. Uh, I, I, I laugh because I'm never on time, so oh, that's okay. why I can, I can relate. So okay, in that I case, try. shake my hand, sir. <laughs> uh, but I, I do try my best, and usually I am able to achieve that. But let's be honest, with all the responsibilities that I have, if we're going to give our patients the courtesy of allowing them to see their doctor at each and every office visit, sometimes... Uh, you know, it's not an emergency, but something will come up that needs my attention, and I might be a little bit late. And so that would be one thing that my staff would tell you about me. Uh, what I would like to actually touch upon is what I would say about my staff. Uh, I love my staff. They are very kind, friendly, and courteous people. I enjoy my work, and I enjoy going to work and working with them. And patients pick up on that very readily. Well, and, and I would say that's, that's half of healthcare is finding that, that comfortable environment where you can feel at home, whether it be the environment you create, like you talked about in your Henderson office or, uh, the hospitality that, that, mm -hmm. uh, your staff and you provide to a patient when they come in and that unique experience tailored to their needs. Correct. These things are critical, uh, because if patients, uh, as I was alluding to with the staff, if they're not pleased with the staff. They won't get to me because I'm not the person who's on the phone scheduling the appointment. It's the staff and the way a person is treated when they're scheduling an appointment, the way they're treated when they come to one of our offices. So if they're not pleased with that interaction, they won't have an opportunity to meet me. And that's very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us on uh, this episode of Inside Medicine. Brendan, it's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, it's it's been great, and I think that I think our listeners and viewers uh, will appreciate knowing more about pain management. And this resource has been here uh, in Southern Nevada and continues to grow. Correct. So, thank you for your time today, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you at other Las Vegas Heels events down the road here. Thank you, Brendan. And and thank you to everyone for uh, joining us today, and look forward to the next episode of Inside Medicine, brought to you by Las Vegas Heels.